Uh, before we get into the official review, I do want to drop a thank you to Raycon for sponsoring today's video yet again. As I mentioned before, Raycon earbuds, such as their latest Everyday E25 lineup, are a damn good brand of wireless Bluetooth earbuds that start at about half the price as any other premium wireless earbuds in the market, while sounding just as good. And are backed by a selection of celebrities and music connoisseurs like Snoop Dogg, Cardi B, and Brandy, just to name a few, so you know you're getting quality. Their sleek, compact design fits all nice and snugly in the ears, giving you a great noise-isolating fit. They last about six hours on a single charge, but you can also charge up the carrying case to give you more hours of playtime on the go. And in my case, where I'm taking music with me to shopping trips or when I'm cleaning up the house or going for a walk or when I'm on the road, that is a damn nifty thing to have. They come in a variety of colors to boot. You'll no doubt find something to match your aesthetical preference. You can save 15% off your order today by following the link in the description below. Buy Raycon.com slash some call me Johnny. Again, that's the everyday E25 lineup from Raycon. Nice and sleek, easy on the wallet. Consider picking up yourself a pair today. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for tuning into today's video. I understand it's been quite a roller coaster of activity the last couple of weeks, thanks to the likes of COVID-19 and such. So I'm personally doing fine. Uh, friends and family in my circle are getting by, but I understand for a lot of folks and, and across the world in the United States, they're stuck at home, whether they, they want to or not. Events and uh, conventions are getting postponed, if not straight up canceled. It's a time to be practicing uh, social distancing. It's nothing you could really do about that, except you know, practice good hygiene, don't hog all the goddamn toilet paper, and I guess this is a time to uh, be catching up on your hobbies and your backlog, and if that includes watching videos on YouTube like this channel right here, uh, I'm more than happy to provide. Let's continue with our trek through the Resident Evil series. Our next game in the lineup is Resident Evil Code Veronica. Interesting case, no numerical value or anything? Was this a spinoff or a proper sequel? Now, as you know, Resident Evil 2 back in 1998 was released for pretty much everything available at the time, all except the Sega Saturn, which after the lukewarm sales of Resident Evil 1 in the system, had little hope of seeing the game properly released for Sega's ill-fated console. So to make up for it, the folks at Capcom promised to make a Resident Evil game exclusively for Sega's other ill-fated console, the Sega Dreamcast. Yes, Code Veronica was originally a Dreamcast exclusive for 12 months and then it saw an updated release titled Code Veronica X on the much more successful PlayStation 2 in 2001. Though the updated version did see a Dreamcast release in Japan, where it's known as Biohazard Code Veronica Kanzenban, which if you didn't know, translates to Code Veronica Complete, suggesting that the product sold to consumers beforehand was incomplete. Great job there, Capcom. Honestly, I am surprised the game even saw a Dreamcast release. And Capcom knew beforehand, before, before the game even got its first public release, that it wasn't gonna do well financially on the console. The Dreamcast was on its way out. The Code Veronica ended up being one of the best-selling Dreamcast titles, but compared to Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3, it wasn't even close, which is why I think Code Veronica X got the greenlit so soon after the you know, initial release. The version I'm playing for this video is the HD remaster on my PlayStation 3, released in 2011. Cleaner visuals and widescreen support just seem like the logical choice, though if you're a stickler for resolution in this age of 4K TVs and what have you, keep in mind that this version is locked to 720p. I had to upscale it to 1080p for this video, and I normally hate doing that, but something had to give. I was going to play this on the PlayStation 4 since I heard it got released on that console, but strangely, the version of Code Veronica X on the PS4 is not the HD remaster but rather an emulated version of the PlayStation 2 port. I don't know if there were compatibility issues, why not just release the HD remaster like they did with the remakes and such? I couldn't tell you, so buyer beware, if you needed to know. But okay, this was Capcom's next major installment in the Resident Evil series, the one that had the company's main attention. You gotta remember that Resident Evil 3 was originally a side game that was transformed into the third game, Lickety Split. You can almost call it a borderline budget title, really. But this game, we are following up on Claire Redfield's plot from Resident Evil 2, looking for her brother Chris from Resident Evil 1. Raccoon City is a thing of the past. We're going on a journey to stop Umbrella, and look at this opening cutscene. This game is only a couple of months past Resident Evil 2, but 
Claire, in the meantime, has been watching an ass load of John Woo films because she is moving, dodging bullets from guards running away from helicopters and pulling some serious John Wick shit with a dropped gun and gas canisters. And folks say Resident Evil 4 is where the series started emphasizing action. No. Code Veronica is the most over the top game we've seen so far in the classic lineup, thanks in large part to the game's decision to go fully 3D. Though the camera is still relatively fixed and tank controls are still here, pre rendered backgrounds are not a thing in Code Veronica, everything is rendered in real time, giving us more dynamic camera angles in both gameplay and cutscenes. I'd be lying out of my ass, of course, if I said the story didn't play a large part in the higher emphasis of cheese. So here we are, we're once again placed in the shoes of Claire Redfield, younger sister of Chris Redfield from Resident Evil 1. After failing to locate her brother at an umbrella facility in Paris, Claire finds herself forcibly taken to a prison in Rockford Island, located in the Southern Oceans far removed from civilization. But before she could demand her phone call, the island is suddenly under attack by an unknown force, allowing her to escape thanks in part to this dude who lets her out of her cell, seeing as he thinks it doesn't really matter anyway. The island is seeing its share of the standard biological outbreak all thanks to the TV. I, I oh, just saying the V word could get the video demonetized in this current climate. So okay, yeah. uh, the thing. Everyone on the island has been exposed to the thing, and now the place is running amok with zombies and other types of bioorganic weapons. Now the measures I gotta take to stay green. While looking for a way to contact her brother, Claire ends up partnering with another inmate of the island, Steve Burnside, who is also looking for a means of escape. The two get close, I guess you can call it that, it's Steve who usually tries to make unsuccessful attempts at wooing Claire, but Claire doesn't really go for it because Steve sucks. But soon these two run into this preppy douche named Alfred Ashford, one half of the Ashford twins, a family that has some history in the creation of the Umbrella Corporation and own the very island Claire is trying to escape from. But while Alfred's engine is running in his head, there's nobody behind the wheel if you catch my drift. I so want to enjoy this. <laughs> Claire and Steve are constantly at odds with Alfred as he repeatedly attempts to stop the two from escaping, but to make matters more complicated, they're also dealing with the one responsible for the attacks on the island, the resurrected Albert Wesker. A real plot twist if the game treated it like one. I don't know, it feels like Wesker just shows up with no real fanfare, as if he just accidentally walked into the set. Shit, if you play Co Veronica X, they also make no secret to hide the fact that Wesker is in the game, he's on the title screen for fuck's sake. Look at him back there, it's like he's photobombing a family picture. Mm. He quickly shows up and just as quickly leaves as Wesker really has sights on Chris. You would think that kidnapping Claire would easily get his attention, but no, Wesker fucks off for the remainder of Claire's side of the story like a bad fever dream. Claire and Steve are on the verge of making their escape, but Alfred manages to remotely control their getaway plane and our heroes find themselves crashing in this umbrella facility in Antarctica. Though in this world, I guess global warming has made it comfortable enough to go out in street clothes and not have to worry about freezing your asses off. After one more final confrontation with Alfred, the two are on the verge of making their escape again again, but once again, they're stopped short, this time by Alexia Ashford, the second half of the Ashford twins that over 15 years ago injected herself with an experimental thingamabob that required to seal herself away for a long time so that she can have full control of her powers when she wakes up. That time is now, and with her magical tentacle, Claire and Steve are forced to extend their stay in the tropical Arctic. We're then suddenly placed in control of Chris Redfield, who begins his search for Claire. Eventually, he manages to hijack this fighter jet and finds himself in Antarctica soon after. Chris manages to rescue Claire in time, but soon he encounters both Alexia and Wesker, who wants Alexia for himself, and the sicky wiki located inside her body, all in the name of science. But despite Wesker's newfound enhancements, Alexia proves too much for the former captain of stars and leaves Chris to do all the fighting, which Chris manages to handle just fine with a shotgun and some recreational drugs. <laughs> Alexia isn't fully down for the count, of course, taking full advantage of her status as final boss and transforms into a grotesque monstrosity that Chris takes down in no time with a combination of explosive arrows and laser beams. Chris and Claire escape the exploding base in the nick of time, Chris vows to put an end to Umbrella, much like Leon did at the end of Resident Evil 2, and Wesker lives to plan his revenge for another day. Huh? But what about Steve, you say? Oh, he transforms into the Jolly Green Giant and dies soon after. What? This game doesn't care about Steve, why the hell should I? God damn talk about a character that falls off my give a shit o meter hard and fast. He's young and hot headed, I've seen that before, sure, but when my first impressions of a character are, eh, I wish this dude would shut up and stop now, you're fighting an uphill battle with me. Even in a life or death situation where teamwork is essential to survival, Steve can come off as whiny and extremely pig headed. Not helping is terrible dialogue like here, where Steve straight up contradicts himself in a speed I thought not possible. See? 
You can depend on me. You see? This thing is a lot more reliable than any person. What? They try, they really do. You got this moment where he has to shoot down his own father who's become a zombie, and if more time was spent on Steve beforehand, if we got to know him a little more, that could be a great way to feel sympathy for the dude. You don't want to see anybody put their own parents down, you know, unless they deserved it. I don't know, Steve's father did work for Umbrella, so maybe he had it coming. Either way, I don't give a shit about this moment, and I especially don't give a shit about Steve, especially after he repeatedly makes dickheaded decisions, like forcing me to find a suitable replacement for these golden guns and need to progress, or flooding the room with poisonous gas because he gets distracted looking at Claire for a brief moment and causes some pipes to rupture. That's another thing, there's an attempt to paint these two in a sort of playful schoolyard relationship but it comes off more as Steve being a real creeper towards Claire. He almost kisses the girl while she's sleeping, that ain't cool, you ever seen the fifth element? Bruce Willis almost got his fucking head shot off because of that, you don't do that. This story really comes and goes. The biggest takeaway is that Wesker is back. He survived his ordeal against the tyrant in the first game by injecting himself with purple drink he got from William Birkin, but he needed to die in order to trigger a reaction. The tyrant was more than happy to oblige, and now Wesker has been reborn with superhuman attributes. He can do borderline matrix shit that was the popular thing to do at this time, and he's got these new uh, cat eye contact lenses, I guess. Sure, he's the whole reason why the island gets infected, but he doesn't personally get involved in much else. We also get some backstory behind the creation of Umbrella, the creation of the Tiva, I vitality drink, and we learn of this dude named Spencer, one of the founding members of Umbrella. What's the story behind that dude? The game isn't gonna tell us that. A story for another time. Code Veronica is set out in building the lore, and that's fine, but as an individual story, it isn't very good. There is something unsettling about the Ashford twins, they give the game some credit. In a darker narrative, you can totally convince me that these two were like banging each other and I'd believe it, but these two were biologically engineered to be hosts for this new whatchamacallit that would bend people to their will, world domination and all that, but only Alexia proved to be worthy of it, so Alfred was kinda left with the sloppy seconds. He still deeply loves his sister, but dude's got separation issues when Alexia goes to sleep for 15 years. There's even a point where he cross-dresses as his sister because that's just the thing he does. Alfred is still entertaining and deeply disturbing. If you ask me, he should have been the sole antagonist. This dude was more than capable of carrying the story given how insane he becomes as it goes along. But his sister comes along and that's what we got for the remainder of the plot. A half human, half dragonfly hybrid that makes you question if it's normal to get a boner from any of this. Maybe they were trying to demonstrate a, a twisted inversion of the brother-sister relationship that Claire and Chris share. These two deeply care for each other, while these two, uh, not really. It'd be an interesting juxtaposition if the twins working together were more of the focus, and if Claire and Chris were together for more than two minutes on screen. Much of the story is Claire and Steve dealing with the Ashfords, but Steve is quickly dropped after they get to Antarctica, and Chris is essentially on damage control, and it's only until the very last encounter that the siblings sort of team up. The whole game should have been Claire and Chris working together. Together. Get rid of Steve, save Wesker for later. The Redfields versus the Ashfords. There's a storyline in there, but that's not what Code Veronica ends up being. The action pieces are okay, standard Resident Evil, really. Presentation is damn good for Dreamcast standards, ambitious, I would even say. I don't know why, though, but Chris's model bothers the hell out of me. His forehead looks fucking gargantuan, or maybe, I don't know, it's, maybe it's his hair? I don't know. I'm sort of missing the live action, dude. The voice acting is hit or miss. I suppose that's also standard. A lot of characters either don't go much beyond Saturday morning cartoon range, or they sound straight out of a bad pornographic parody. That's nothing new for Resident Evil, but with the better graphics and such, it is noticeably more distracting. <laughs> to a lot of folks, Code Veronica was seen not only as a proper follow-up to Resident Evil 2 in terms of story, but also a continuation of what Resident Evil set out to do gameplay-wise. In a way, this sort of works for and against the game. If you loved Resident Evil 3, Code Veronica is gonna seem like a step back. You still got the quick 180 turn, that's great to have, but you can't dodge attacks anymore, despite that mechanic being inherently weird in the first place. Uh, there's no gunpowder mixing, there's no roguelike elements and items and enemy placement anymore, and there's no ongoing threat like Mr. X or Nemesis. But hey, if you like that giant worm from Resident Evil 3, the one that kind of shows up out of nowhere and is quickly dealt with, Code Veronica has one of those too, and it's somehow even more superfluous. You don't even need to fight the thing with Claire, and Chris only needs to kill it if you want some submachine gun soon after. I have never played a Resident Evil game where there was so much goddamn backtracking, one that had such obtuse means of solving simple puzzles or unlocking the next route, or one that couldn't make up its mind on balancing. One second I'm thinking this game is a comfortable ride, the next I'm thinking, okay, what the fuck, where'd the sensible design go? And next I'm thinking, where the hell was that one room located in a game that gives you a fully functional map? 
God, I hate it, Rockford Island. It's a prison, it's a training facility, it's a mansion, it's a cornucopia of things that try so hard to pay respects to its predecessors without having any of the memorable design or cohesion. Not as claustrophobic as Raccoon City and Resident Evil 3, but infinitely more forgettable. I was popping up that map like I was on a treasure hunt with a five second memory. I couldn't recall where certain rooms were because places either looked so similar to one another and blended right in, or they felt like they belonged in entirely different locations. I recall when I got my hands on this painting. I knew the exact room it needed to go in, but I didn't remember where it was exactly, but I figured it was in the castle because the feel of the room gave off that impression, so I thought it was there, but I was dead wrong. That room was in the military training facility, the not police station of Code Veronica, and were they trying to pay homage to Resident Evil 2 with the museum police station for this one room? That feels very sloppy, and I lost a bit of time trying to relocate this place. What's with the guillotine here? A prison area with only one guillotine? Did the budget dry up? I'm gonna assume so, because this prison area just has this random as hell rock trap that, okay, legitimately makes me nervous as a game mechanic, but it's no less nonsensical. And this game has a hard-on for elevators too, and you better memorize which ones take you where, because there's a lot of times where you need to approach rooms from different floors because of new circumstances or puzzle solving. The game ditches the pre-rendered backgrounds and has a more dynamic camera. It does a much better job keeping track of your character, giving you a better sense of awareness and, in a strange way, makes the controls kind of feel better, despite it still being the standard tank controls. The game looks good altogether for Dreamcast standards anyway, and the HD remaster does the graphics justice. It can feel a little too sterile at times, but I thought it had a good atmosphere throughout. Is it just me though, or are an unusual amount of areas and items in this game overly dark? It was a miracle that I was able to see the collectibles on the ground and all, but still, there was so many herbs and things like shotgun shells I passed by because I legitimately didn't see them on the ground. They're so muted in color this time. I know I probably spent a good third of the game just going back and forth between item boxes as a means of putting shit away for later or suddenly needing something I didn't have to use for a long time. I didn't do this for my playthrough, but that fire extinguisher you get early on for that one obstacle, keep that shit in your item box when you're done with it. If you don't, you're not getting the magnum near the end of the game. Huh, that's what you get for thinking that one use item was one use, like it usually is. But not getting access to the de facto Resident Evil weapon didn't really hurt me looking back. The game, much like Resident Evil 2, is at points generous with ammo pickups and such, and man, if you love the bow gun from Resident Evil 2, that son of a bitch gets all the love in this game with how much ammo you can pick up for it. There's even these explosive rounds for it that I think are the best things to use against bosses if you didn't get the magnum. It destroyed things like Alexia's second form in no time. Because they give you so many damn bolts for the weapon, I figured it wouldn't hurt to try it out. Try and save some of the regular bullets, you know, and some of the later guns, especially after modifications, eat them up like crazy. The bow gun is okay, it's primarily zombie fodder, but it still takes a good chunk of shots to put a zombie down, or it can do shit like this and phase through the assholes at near point blank range. What the fuck, I have auto aim turned on, why is it like this? Eh, never mind, I'm going back to the usual. There's a couple of guns that even let you dual wield and target multiple enemies at once, but it's not very reliable, mainly because it's entirely up to the game to decide when it wants to multi-target. When it works, it's great. It was super cathartic taking down two hunters at once with submachine guns, but when it doesn't work, you're wasting bullets or not giving proper attention to the more eminent threat. At least there's still stuff like the grenade launcher and shotguns, even if ammo for these weapons specifically is considerably scarcer than previously. You can be a little liberal with them, however. I ended up not using most of my grenade rounds because I wasn't sure if I was going to need them for later on. I played it too safe. That's always the risk though, isn't it? The game might just throw a sudden boss fight at you when you least expect it, but uh, not really. I can only think of this tyrant that has sock and boppers for hands. Then there's this one which you fight in this dense ass fog and then there's Alexia. There are some encounters that have a little more significance, mainly your introduction to new enemies, but they are quickly demoted to fodder as the rest of them are, and the others, you can just ignore them. The giant worm that I mentioned earlier, this electrical thing in the pool, this giant spider in the arctic base, I don't count the fight with mutated steel because it's just a glorified quick time event. Yeah, not, not much in boss encounters, but this game sure loves throwing a bunch of common shit at you. Zombies are everywhere, usually in high density levels too, and after some time, those areas you've already combed about 10 times are now suddenly swarming with the creatures. I mean, that is a good sign that you're going the right way and making progress, but I think this game goes a little overboard at points. 
There's also several instances where enemies are just straight up obscured from view because of the camera angles, and against these things, the bandersnatch, this mac and cheese dinner gone horribly wrong, you're bound to take a few cheap shots because they can attack you from a distance with their stretchy arms. And goodness me, there are so many goddamn hunters in Chris's part of the game, and they can kill you as quickly as they have in earlier games. There's even some that poison you on contact. I wasn't starving for blue herbs to heal myself, and they're not difficult to take down, especially with the shotgun, but again, there's too many of them. Like the zombies, the game goes a little overboard. I am very mixed on Code Veronica because I played the game just fine, but it felt like it was one of the most exhausting games in the series for me. And based on my recording time, this didn't take much longer to complete than the first Resident Evil, and I don't recall complaining about how tiring that game felt with exception to Chris's scenario. The backtracking adds up, and without prior knowledge or hindsight or the lack of a guide, you'll be trekking back and forth more times than what was ever needed in the previous games. Strangely, I think what also makes it worse is how they handled Claire and Chris's scenarios, though it's a little interesting accurate to call it that in the context of this game. Instead of choosing between Claire and Chris when the game starts, the two share the same journey, so to speak. You start off as Claire, you proceed along, and then around the halfway point, you're in control of Chris for the rest of it. Fundamentally, it's not much different than before, but when both characters are tied to the same journey, it, in a weird way, sort of emphasizes the repetition of the game design. When you finish things with Claire, you've done the prison, you've done the training facility, you've done the castle, and now you're off to Antarctica and you proceed to do the umbrella facility. Then when you switch control to Chris, you're back on the island where you have to take him through the training facility, etc, etc. Chris's venture is not one to one the same given the new circumstances, but spiritually it's very similar and it's also filled with tons of backtracking in its own way. Again, that adds up. Mechanically, it is a classic Resident Evil game. You got your fair share of weapons, ammo and health are abundant to keep you going, they fucking drown you in ink ribbons so that you can practically save the game anytime you head back to a typewriter. If you die during specific events, the game even lets you retry from where you left off without having to reload your save file and that's good, that saves on time, I like that. I wish it were a little more consistent, sometimes I pick retry and I'm back to the beginning of the boss fight, and sometimes I'm back to my last typewriter, so that isn't really a retry, why call it that? As before, there's also the battle mode where you pick a character and make your way through a chain of areas in a certain amount of time to get a good rank. They give you infinite ammo for all your weapons this time, and the goal is to kill everything in sight as fast as you can and then defeat the boss. You can't even leave the current room until everything in sight is dead. It's a more action-oriented battle mode. You can even play it in this first-person mode that looks about as clunky as it controls. Code Veronica was released soon after Resident Evil Survivor, the PS1 game that had the FPS camera, so maybe they traded development notes or something, who knows. The sequel to Survivor was called Resident Evil Survivor 2 Code Veronica, so maybe this was like a, a prototype of that game. Testing the waters, you know. One of the characters you can unlock for this is Wesker, but he only gets the combat knife. I mean, the knife is actually pretty damn useful in this game overall, so it's not all bad, but you see him do all this flippy shit in the main story. He's got all that enhanced power, but he's reduced to swiping at things like he's tending weeds in his garden. <laughs> there is nothing complicated about Code Veronica, and the puzzles are once again on the negligible side. Not as brain dead as Resident Evil 2, but not as interesting as Resident Evil 3. It is quite simple to deduce where you need to go next, but nevertheless I found myself looking at that map so many times because the layout was so damn uninspired and meandering as all hell. It's tough to recommend this one because I personally didn't think much of it. There wasn't anything I absolutely hated, but it does a lot of annoying shit like the thing I mentioned earlier. I know we got the remake of Resident Evil 3 on the way, and I can't wait to dive into that, but if there was ever a game that needed a second go around, it's Code Veronica if you ask me. I wanted to like this game more, but as is, I've played it once for this video, and that's enough for me. Give it a go if you're looking for another classic Resident Evil to play. You might see something I didn't see, or some things that bothered me won't affect you the same way, but stay away if you're on the fence at all. It doesn't beat Resident Evil 2 or 3, not to me anyway. So okay, uh, Code Veronica is finished, and next time we got ourselves a double decker. I know the remake of Resident Evil 3 is on the horizon again. I cannot wait to sink my teeth into that. But first, we have to look at the remake of the first Resident Evil game, We're heading back into that series, and then we're gonna look at its companion piece, Resident Evil Zero, both originally released for the Nintendo GameCube. We're obviously gonna be looking at the HD remasters when I get to it, but yeah, uh, that's the plan. Sorry for making you wait for this one and there's not much else I can say, but you know, wash your hands, wipe your asses, keep yourselves safe. I hope you're enjoying your, your Animal Crossings and your Doom Eternals. I'll catch you guys next time with the next video. Please, please stay safe in this, in this age of, of uncertainty and anxiety. I know it's, it's pretty hard for a lot of folks out there, but I'll do what I can to supply the goods when I can, and as long as you're watching, I will keep providing. Have a fantastic night, and 
take care. I know, kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, bungled that outro, but uh, whatever. <laughs>